Hello, and welcome to this event in the CEASE virtual lecture series entitled Japanese Green Tea in Wisconsin and the Midwest in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. My name is David Fields, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have found your way to this event, it is likely that our center offers other events and programming that might be interesting to you as well. So please visit us at eastasia.wisc.edu for details about future programming and for more information. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for East Asian Studies and also the Department of History. And we are honored today to have introducing our speaker, Sarah Thal, Professor Thal is the David Kenzie and Mary Wyman Professor of History at UW-Madison and specializes in the history of early modern and modern Japan. She is the author of numerous articles and essays, as well as the book, Rearranging the Landscape of the Gods, the Politics of Pilgrimage Site in Japan, 1573 to 1912, published by the University of Chicago Press. Professor Thal. Thank you very much for introducing our speaker today. Great. Thank you, David. And it is my absolute delight to introduce Professor Rob Hellyer, who is Associate Professor at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. And Rob burst on the scene in 2005. I was so impressed by um, a couple of articles that he published, most notably one in the International History Review, and really changed my view of um, maritime uh, doings in the East Asia um, he, with the article, The Missing Pirate and the Pervasive Smuggler, which was just a joy to read and really transformative. And that really, that was sort of a precursor to his 2009 book, Defining Engagement, Japan and Global Context, 1640 to 1868. So Rob really made his name as a historian of international trade in East Asia um, and diplomacy um, in the early modern period. And since then, more recently, he's done work on the Meiji Restoration for its 150th anniversary, thinking about this formative event in the establishment of modern Japan in both history and memory, and now has turned to and is nearing the end of um, writing a book on the Japanese tea trade in the US. So I am absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Hellyer to our to the Center for East Asian Studies and I'm very eager to hear what you've got to say. So thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction. Thank you also to David and Lori for helping to make this possible. Um, I'll jump right in and, and share the PowerPoint that I prepared for today. And what I'd like to, oops. Let's try this again. What I'd like to first talk about are perceptions of tea in the American experience. Uh, tea is often seen as not quintessentially American. And I believe many times there's still vestiges of the idea that you find a lot in popular portrayals of tea, that Americans gave up tea and embraced coffee with patriotic ardor with the Boston Tea Party. In scholarly works that have been, uh, and there's been more of them, uh, wonderfully, uh, a lot of new monographs about tea in world history in recent years, still look at tea in the United States as being defined by British merchants, or by Americans who feel that they need to imitate the practices of their colonial overlords. Um, and that there's not really a distinct types of American tea practices. And today we're in the United States where tea is generally consumed with black tea, often with milk and sugar. And I believe there's a lot of times the assumption that this has been the practice going back for uh, since independence. Well, perceptions of tea in Japan, tea is of course introduced from China in medieval times, and China continued to influence consumption practices into the 16th century. 
However, beyond that, and here again, I'm offering a perception, is that tea drinking in Japan is influenced largely by internal trends. And an additional perception is that a particular type of green tea, sencha, has dominated since it was developed in the 18th century. And you'll see here in this image to the right is sencha. Um, today, it is the most widely consumed type of green tea in Japan. And when it's brewed, it has a very rich green color, as you can see on the cup of tea on the left. Today, just a note, I'm not gonna be talking about the tea ceremony. It's something that is a wonderful part of Japanese culture and it's been richly researched, but I'm looking at a different aspect, uh, the more everyday aspects of tea in Japan in the United States. So my goals today are to chart the surprisingly connected stories of tea in the United States and Japan. I also want to trace Japanese green tea in Wisconsin and the Midwest more broadly in the 19th, late 19th century. Finally, I'd also like to explain tea consumption patterns in the US and Japan today, talking about the historical foundations of both of those. So first of all, in giving any tea talk, I do like to start with some of the basics. And tea is organized into three main areas, three, three categories of green tea, oolong tea, and black tea. Now these are all defined by the level of oxidation. So therefore, green tea is, this process of oxidation is stopped very quick, quickly after picking so most green teas, when they're brewed, have a green color, although not exclusively. I'll talk about how some have a more yellowish or brown color when brewed. Oolong tea is allowed to oxidize a bit longer, and so therefore has a light or yellow and to a brown color when brewed. And black tea is allowed to oxidize even longer, and therefore has a black brew um, when it is uh, infused. Next, I'd like to talk about tea and some introduction of tea in the American experience. Now, during colonial times, uh, tea was, the types of tea that were consumed were both green and black. And wonderful references to, for example, Thomas Jefferson, as part of his life, he liked green teas and he switched to black teas. Uh, also, George Washington would drink both types of teas at different times during the day. So we have quite a diversity of teas in the colonial period. But after around 1800, green tea starts to take over and be the most popular type of tea in the United States. Now, I'm not exactly sure why this switch happened, but it is very clear after this point that green tea has a much, holds an era, an aura, I should say, of sophistication. And to give you an illustration of this, I found in a, in a newspaper that was published in Trenton, New Jersey around 1804, an attack on the high living of President Thomas Jefferson. Well, this attack said that he lived high, riding around in his coach, drinking green tea with loaf sugar added to it, while the rest of the farmers had to walk or ride their horses and could only have a, a, the molasses and certainly couldn't afford green tea. Green tea in the first decades of the American Republic was consumed both in the North and the South at meals, at tea parties, and also in punches. Um, tea punches were particularly popular in the South uh, where you would brew green tea, add some alcohol to it. Sometimes you would add some milk or cream and voila, you've had the makings of a great party. Now, to show you an illustration of how prominent green tea was in the United States, this is a ad from a newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina in 1818. I've sort of crudely uh, put green atop the list of teas that are available on the right. And there are five teas that are being sold, but only one of them is a black tea, showing then the dominance of green tea in uh, for, for most of the early period of the American Republic. Now we start to see in the 1870s, a regional twist. 
And this is oolong tea that is produced in Taiwan that starts to be exported to the United States. Now, this oolong becomes a fad in particularly New England and along the eastern seaboard. And so this is one of the first diversifications of, of American tea since around 1800. So what happens after that? Well, the Midwest becomes green tea country. The Midwest, of course, from the 1870s, surging with economic growth, new cities that are uh, growing in population. And we see, um, and this is illustrated in, in newspapers or in merchant accounts of the time, describing about how that particularly uh, in areas, and this is a map that was created actually from the 1920s by Japanese tea merchants, but it shows the parts of the United States of where green tea was the most popular. And I think it's safe to say this is consistent going back to the 1870s. So if you can see then from upstate New York, these areas that are slightly shaded green and the deeper green are the green tea country. So going up into Northern Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, also Minnesota, the Dakotas, Nebraska, and um, Iowa are all these areas of which where green tea is the most popular. And we might say that Midwesterners are therefore more conservative in their choice of teas, not following the new fad of oolong, but following the established American practice of consuming green teas. Now, I should say that there's never been a, in this period, a, a specific type of American style consumption. Many Americans uh, would add milk and sugar to their green tea, but that was not um, established practice as say, for example, uh, chai tea in India today that is consumed in a certain, normally in a certain way, um, with, with milk and sugar uh, added to it. To turn now to Japan, um, China had controlled the world's export market until the 1960s. The only tea that the Westerners could get was going to Canton, uh, but Japan bursts on the scene. In 1859, three Japanese ports are opened for trade with Westerners. And one of the first, or one of the most important products that emerges from this is tea. And what happens is that tea prices, um, the, the sale price for tea, the, I should say the purchase price for tea, um, if you were to, 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 to produce it and then sell it to an export firm, goes up steadily over the course of the 1860s and 1870s. And so therefore, there is a lot of new tea, tea fields planted and parts of Japan that had never been the main tea producing regions emerged to be what we might call tea powerhouses. And this is the case with Shizuoka Prefecture that you see on the map on the left. Shizuoka um, is near Mount Fuji. And actually in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, a lot of the former uh, vassals of the Tokugawa uh, resettled in Shizuoka and became tea farmers. Um, also farmers that had been producing other products turned to tea. And as we can see in this image, and if you go to Shizuoka today, you can see tea fields everywhere. This is a vestige of what happened um, due to American demand in the 1860s and 1870s because the Western merchants that were involved in developing the trade identified very early the United States as being the prime market because different from Britain at the time, Americans preferred green tea. Now the main type of tea that was exported was sencha. Um, so therefore the really better quality teas um, are being exported in this period to the United States. I'd like to turn now to talk a bit about then, how did green tea get to Wisconsin? Um, and some a bit about how the market played out. The tea was brought by steamers from Japanese ports like Kobe or Yokohama, mainly to New York, but also to San Francisco, and then brought by rail to Chicago, the great marketplace, of course, 
um, in the Midwest. Now these import firms or others would then transport the tea to Midwest cities and towns uh, from Chicago. But interestingly, and, and I've, part of the book, I've been tracing as much as possible uh, the people involved in the market at every step of it. And I found very interesting uh, stories about the jobbers, uh, a term for independent salesmen who would go and set up orders with uh, groceries or other uh, retail outlets in the Midwest. So this is something that I found on eBay um, that is the calling card of a jobber um, from, oops, um, from Wisconsin, uh, sorry, from, from Milwaukee. Um, and I believe that he would say, I'd call you about, he'd write in the date uh, and the time, and he would send this in the post and make his arrangements for his circuit of areas he would visit in Wisconsin or other parts of the Midwest, usually in the spring, and set up the orders for the tea that would be coming um, in that following season. So he is, this jobber would be selling the tea, as I mentioned, to grocers, but also one of the things I've been intrigued to find is that in many towns in the Midwest, including Wisconsin, there are in business directories listed as men who sell just tea. Therefore, they're tea men, but not coffee men. And I've been intrigued by this, again, perhaps going back to that perception of thinking about Americans turning to coffee, um, about how much that there would be this retail element uh, focused very much on tea. Next, I'd like to turn then to the labels, uh, which are another great source that gives us a hint about how Americans were understanding uh, and choosing the types of green tea. And this is the uh, label that I think was used for publicizing his talk. Thanks for getting the permission for this, uh, Lori and Sarah. Um, that shows then a grocer, or in this case, a mercantile that would be selling green tea in Wisconsin. And it shows the exotic element or a picture of green tea. Now, this was a time in the United States and in the Western world when Japanisma, um, this interest in Japanese, things Japanese, um, among artistic and elite circles was certainly playing a role in increasing interest in Japan. However, based on my research, I've surmised that only really a few, few wealthy Midwesterners would purchase Japanese green tea, and then along with it, purchase Japanese teaware uh, to consume it. So the point being, would there be an invitation of Japanese tea parties? Probably not so much. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but that was not really the core of the trend of consumption. Because the majority of the labels that we have for tea are more like the ones that we see in the screen here. The one on the left is a company in the Finger Lakes region in uh, up, up New York State. Middle, as you can see, uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, excuse me. And one on the right is one of my favorites. Uh, the Union Lumber Company in Fort Bragg, California, that is marketing its own brand of green tree. Now, I, I don't think those people here would be thinking of who would be buying it, uh, their tea from a lumber company would necessarily be interested in it, it, Japanese green tea as an exotic product. I'd also like to note here that on all of these labels, it has an indication of how the tea is prepared, whether it be pan fired, whether it be um, basket fired, as you see on the right. Now, I'm going to introduce these practices in a moment, but suffice to say, this is uh, one of the ways of which Midwesterners would also be choosing their types of Japanese green tea based upon the, the firing method. So the tea that I mentioned in places that had been produced, for example, in Shizuoka would be uh, shipped to, in this case, these are images from Yokohama, where in big factories in Yokohama um, from the 1860s into the early 20th century, uh, accounts of people visiting Yokohama would note about the aroma of tea being roasted really from the spring until the fall 
And these large factories that would be roasting it, the tea, why were they doing this? Because the extra moisture needed to be removed from it before it was packed into chest and shipped um, across the Pacific or via the Atlantic to New York to prevent mold from uh, forming in it during the shipment. So in these factories, and you can see um, in both cases that it, it is mainly women and the accounts here that uh, women who were working in these, these jobs, it, it was a really difficult work. It would have been really hot um, in these factories working from early in the morning to late at night. And as these images show, the tea would be stirred to, with heat underneath to gradually remove the moisture. And so whether it was done then in these pans on the right or the basket on the left, um, or the two different types of, of main preparation that was used. Now I'd like to also note that there are uh, in other descriptions of the particular pan firing that there would be next to uh, the women that were working the pans, a little receptacle that would include an important element that was added to the tea. And this was often was called Prussian blue. Prussian blue was a pigment that was developed in the 18th century to dye blue, the uniforms of the Prussian army, but it made its way to China where it was used as a coloring to make tea green for Western consumers. Later, um, as a side note, it made its way to Japan in the 19th century and was used a lot in Yukioi prints as well. The coloring was done not to hoodwink Americans, but rather because Americans really wanted their teas green. When they purchased at the store, if it had not been colored because the tea that had been fired in this way would often be white or gray, Americans wouldn't purchase it. So therefore, to meet this demand, Japanese producers would add the coloring. Which brings me then to another reference that I was delighted to find thanks to a, a colleague that uh, studying American literature and about a novelist of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Hamlin Garland, uh, a native of Wisconsin who, as I understand, as a teenager moved to Massachusetts and then later on to California. But Garland wrote many stories about farm life in Wisconsin and in the Midwest in the late 19th century, including Under the Lion's Paw, as you see here. Uh, and I'm not gonna try and read out this passage for us. I hope you've had the chance to read it, but I would like to emphasize this is a, a chat between uh, two women, um, Mrs. Haskins, Miss Haskins and Mrs. Council. As you can see, Miss Council is talking about how she, the types of green tea she likes. And she's mentioning Young Heisen or Gunpowder, which are types of green tea, which she doesn't prefer, but she likes the real green tea. It says comes off the vines. Now I have to speculate here, but the real green tea off the vines would have been actually the most expensive one. And to estimate then of what a farm family might have, I conclude, and in many cases, that the people who would be buying the colored teas would be then a rural family where uh, money was tight. Um, and I've mentioned, and I mentioned in the book, about I think that this coloring of tea is actually a very intriguing trend in American consumption because this is a way how green tea is democratized. Green tea, which had been going back to 1800, the sophisticated product and more expensive than other black teas. But if you have a colored tea that is made from a lower grade of tea, but then spruced up, if you will, with coloring, this could then mean that someone again, tied in expenses, could buy that type of tea and participate in this same tea consumption pattern as others. Well, the world tea market starts to change pretty dramatically in the 1890s, and this is because the expansion, dramatic expansion, of tea production in British South Asia. Now you can see um, these figures of how quickly in the 1880s the growth is first in India and then in Ceylon, both British colonies. And soon British merchants are able to capture the British market, also making a chunk at other colonial markets such as Australia. 
and it's a pretty dramatic shift because in even as 1865, 95% of the tea consumed in Britain was Chinese tea. Um, but the British merchants were able to convince Britons to turn to these Indian teas and Ceylonese teas. Um, and then they turned their sights on the United States and started in the 1890s a marketing campaign, a negative campaign that was implemented and focused on portraying green tea in three main ways, dirty, dangerous, and fraudulent. And what was emphasized in many cases was the idea that tea production in China and Japan, they were exclusively exporting green tea, was done in haphazard ways. And one of the tropes that was often mentioned was the dirty coolie in a Japanese or Chinese factory. Working under some of the pans that we saw, for example, uh, the descriptions would say that they was wearing only limited clothing and sweating a lot, and that the sweat would get into that tea, creating the peculiar flavor, as, is, as it was noted, of Japanese teas. And this is on the screen here, a image, uh, an advertisement from the Chicago Tribune in 1896, where it's criticizing these, the poppy and coolie labor that is used to develop, or I should say grow and process um, Japanese green teas. And just to finish this off here, the India and Salem black teas were presented as being uh, more trustworthy. For one, they were described as, as being white supervised, um, that there were still, yes, the coolies in India and Ceylon, but they were under white supervision. And also that mechanization was more widely used in the India and Chinese cases, therefore to assure a better quality product. Well, Sadly, over time, this negative campaign uh, had an impact. And it probably would have had an earlier impact if not for World War I, um, when the supply lines of Indian Ceylon tea were cut. And it became a, a, actually the, the peak time of Japanese tea exports because Japan was not feeding on the United States, but also to British and European markets and reaching in 1916, 1917, some of the highest production they've ever had um, of sencha and other teas are being exported. But after around 1920, we see then um, a clear turn of Americans to black teas. And there's an increasing prominence of national black tea brands. There is, um, The, 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 why this, this turn happened, I think there's a combination of the negative campaigns that I talked about here. There is some lower price, at times lower price, of India and Ceylon teas. And then also there is a sadly related to a reputation that um, Chinese and Japanese teas are of lower quality. All these things coming together then lead to the dominance of black teas and particularly then growing into the 1930s of more national brands like the ones that we see here of Chase and, and Sanborn. Setting a consumption pattern then from the 1920s that continues to this day because today still in the United States, 90% of the tea that is consumed is black tea. Well, to finish off and talk a bit about Japan, um, everyday tea in Japan for 1920 There'd been sencha consumed, yes, but much of the tea that people were consuming was bancha, um, which is a lower grade of green tea. And as I mentioned at the start, yes, this is a green tea, but it produces a brown brew. And bancha was prevalent, number one, because so many Japanese were living in the countryside and growing their own tea, as they had done since the Edo period, picking it in particular ways that are particular to, to regions. Um, and so Bancha dominated in that, but also one of the things that I was so intrigued to find in my research was that even in the 1920s, that in Tokyo or other urban areas, many elites liked Bancha better. I think it's the same way of it's healthier for you, much in the same way that uh, brown bread or brown rice 
um, would be healthier as well. So Sencha is out there, but it's not the dominant type of tea consumed in Japan until the 1920s. Why does this happen? Well, because as I just mentioned in 1916, it's a wonderful year of the tea export industry. They're producing so much sencha, but then a few years later, the bottom drops out of the market. They're facing a glut. And so there, for the first time, Japanese tea merchants turn to the home market in a very dedicated way. And they want to challenge the perceptions of sencha that I just outlined. And what follows is a promotion of Sencha as a health product, namely being high in vitamin C. And the image on the right um, is all in Japanese, but it is about the levels of vitamin C in various products of tomatoes, of different fruits. But in the middle there that you have, you know, jutting up to the top, this red and blue, this is Japanese green tea and particularly Sencha and is described as having a higher vitamin C content than even bancha. This is, of course, intentional. There's also a lot of money spent on campaigns to convince elites and others to consume more sencha. For example, promoting it as a gift uh, that would be purchased at department stores or sent during a particular holidays. The long and short of it, this is all quite successful. And these campaigns help to make Sencha much more consumed in Japan from the 1920s and 1930s, creating then a pattern that is continues to this to, to today. So to conclude, I hope I've outlined up to this point uh, about how we can see a distinctive American tea culture with green tea at its center. Also, I hope I've outlined here the, what for me is really an intriguing connection of sencha. And the fact that so much sencha was, well, first there's so much demand from the United States in the 1860s and 1870s that helped create an export industry, helped create much more cultivation of tea. And then later in the 19 teens that uh, created the high times, the most, uh, 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 of the export trade leads then to a greater Japanese consumption of sencha. So my final point, and something I've just outlined a moment ago, but seeing the 1920s as the origin of today's U.S. and Japanese tea consumption patterns. I will end it there. All right. Rob, thank you very much for that fascinating discussion of green tea in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and uh, the United States. And as someone who grew up going to school in West Salem, Wisconsin, which is the home of Hamlin Garland, or at least that's where his homestead is, and uh, in, in high school, having to read Under a Lion's Paw as one of the stories that everyone read in high school, I, um, I'm, I'm fascinated to see that reference, which of course did not uh, stand out to me when I was 14 or 15 years old, that uh, this is something that's significant. But now, you know, being a scholar of US and East Asian relations, it is quite interesting that that reference would be in the kind of writing that Hamlin Garland did. Um, and as we're, as, as we're waiting for some questions to come in, I think I have uh, a few questions of my own that can maybe just get us started. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if the opening of relations between the US and Japan in the, the, 50, the 1850s and 1860s, if that spurred the consumption of, of green tea in the US, because it, it seems like there was already a lot of green tea being consumed before that happened. And I wonder if that caused a greater consumption or did that result in a displacement of tea coming from China um, and maybe replaced with Japanese tea or what was the export market like for China as well? Was there competition between Chinese and Japanese teas in the US in, in the 19th century? So any, any of those, if, if you wanna take a stab at them. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and it's great to know more about Hamlin Garland as well. Um, <laughs> to answer, yes, there was a lot of competition um, and between Chinese and Japanese teas because 
So the first order of business as Japan is developing its export and industry is to carve out a share of the US market that is totally dominated by China. How is this done? Um, a bit of luck actually, in the sense that there is a lot of racist attitudes towards Chinese um, in the 1870s and 1880s. And I've been surprised in looking at advertisements from that period that there is less uh, harsh critiques of Japanese and Japanese tea as there are of Chinese tea. So this is one of the ways of which Japanese tea gets a foothold in the US market from the 1870s and 1880s. It's also the fact that this is the American economy um, is growing in places like the Midwest and there are more Americans too with, with immigration. Um, so I'd say those combination of the domestic factors and then also the racism um, within the United States. And, and did the normalization of relations, or I should say the establishment of relations between Japan and, and the United States have an effect on this trade or, or not really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that was the first step that had to be done with the opening of the ports. Okay. And then therefore, um, you have Western, well, I should say British and, and American merchants that come. I've looked mainly at some of the British merchants in Nagasaki, but it is interesting that they have a huge influence in saying, right, we have this green tea, where should we try and sell it? Wow. Let's go to the U.S. and okay. not try and compete on the British market with Chinese. Uh, so that's a uh, interesting way of the the international flavor of this whole project and and the development of the trade. All right, oh, we have we have a question um, come in that says, "What role did the Japanese American merchant community play in facilitating this trade or in PR efforts to combat the negative images of Japanese tea post?" 1918. Uh, well, thank you. Yes, it. There's not there's distinct links with the Japanese American community. Are there a few Japanese or Japanese Americans? I'm not quite sure about their, you know, if they've become American citizens or born in the U.S. Um, but it is the Japan Central Tea Association, um, which is starting campaigns in the US, particularly after that negative uh, campaign that is promoted by the Indian Ceylon Tea Lobby from the 1890s. And they are going to world fairs in the, in, in the Midwest, in Chicago, there's one in Omaha, and there's one of course in St. Louis, and making concerted effort to try and show the purity of Japanese green tea. The question was about after 1918, I'm not sure of the community, Japanese American community, but I do know um, one Japanese, I believe he was born in Japan, but was living in, in, in Texas. Um, he opened a tea room in San Antonio, and then he was also in charge of promoting tea at the Chicago, um, the Century of Progress Chicago World's Fairs in 1930, 33 and 34. Um, so it's more, actually of the Japan Central Tea Association and the American import firms working in together to try and overcome this negative perception of Japanese green tea. All right, thank you. We, we have another question come in, a very interesting one. Uh, what about the amount of green tea sold in the upper Midwest in comparison to New England and the far West? You've gently touched on racism as a factor, but maybe the lack of Asian immigrants in the upper Midwest meant that the lack of overt racism uh, that existed on the coast led to more consumption in the Midwest. Is, have, have you come across any inklings of that? Or yeah, was the Midwest consuming more uh, Japanese green tea than other parts of the country? Um, well, there's certainly clear that the, the Midwest was the main consuming area. Um, this is from, as outlined, from the 1870s. There's, of course, some consumed in other parts of the U.S. on the West Coast of the United States. But to bring in this anti-Japanese sentiment that starts to emerge on the West Coast from the you know, 1890s into the early 20th century, I found very little links to any kind of negative campaigns against Japanese green tea. Why? I, I surmise that these um, campaigns against Japanese, uh, if you read their literature, is saying the threat is to our labor force. Mm. 
that these Japanese are coming in and stealing our jobs. Um, and so therefore I've found very little critiques from these type of, of anti-Japanese groups against saying we have to boycott Japanese green tea, which surprised me. Um, but actually, in this case, the, the racism that is introduced is from the British merchants that are talking about how the coolie, as I outlined here, and those descriptions, sadly, Americans are very receptive to those receptions. But it is a, well, I just say an interesting twist of, about how, how that racism influences um, Japanese tea and, and on the US market. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Uh, another question we got, and, and that is wanting to know a little bit more about how you got into this topic. And did you start with studying Japanese tea and then find the US connection? Or did you start by studying tea consumption in the US and, and see the, uh, the connection to Japan? Well, um, I, as I put it, I'm right in my preface to my book, I got into it because of my grandmothers. Um, my paternal grandmother, and I, I grew up um, in Tacoma, Washington, which is near Seattle. Um, I was fortunate to live very close to both my grandmothers. And my paternal grandmother, right after she, she married uh, my grandfather, and uh, my family had been involved in the tea export industry in Japan. Um, and so she went to Shizuoka, lived there. Uh, in the, the 1930s, and she had shared stories of me about Japan, pictures of Japan. So when I graduated from college, I really wanted to go to Japan and learn about, about tea. But I should say it's also um, about my maternal grandmother who lived nearby, and she grew up in rural Illinois, um, and she still kept many of the sensibilities of her youth, where she said that I only I grew up eating um, American foods. And she's, she would describe foreign foods as garlic and pizza, which she would not eat. But I remember she had kept in her cupboard green tea and I asked her about it once. I said, Grandma, what's this? Why do you have it? Oh, we, we used to drink that growing up. Green tea's great. So it is came to me um, about both my grandmothers that this story was as a historian of Japan and my family history in Japan, but then also um, the story of my maternal grandmother in Illinois that I wanted to bring together. Oh, wonderful. That, that makes your book seem all the more fascinating now <laughs> that you have such a, a personal connection to this. Um, we, we've had another question come in and it says, besides the visual advertisements by the sellers you showed in your presentation, in what other ways did merchants promote the consumption of Japanese green tea in the Midwest? For example, were there any instructions or demonstrations as to how to correctly prepare the tea. And I guess one thing I am, I am curious about too, which, which relates to this, is do we have any way of knowing whether once the tea had gone through that process of being dried, of had, having Prussian blue added to it, of being shipped across the ocean, of being you know, put on rail to Chicago and then eventually to places in Wisconsin, did it taste like the tea, like the sencha that they would drink in Japan or did that whole process really create a new product for the American market? Um, it was a new product for the American market. Um, it was a different product that, you know, Japanese didn't want to drink. Um, they didn't want really to want to make it. They wanted to sell their pure teas, but this is what Americans wanted was that color tea. Um, and so uh, about the taste, uh, the difference, I think the tea that you'll purchase in Japan today, the Sencha, um, that type of tea was really only available in the US market from around the 1910 or so. Why? Because that's when mechanization really started to kick in. Um, and you could have all of this process um, without going through the firing, uh, the roasting that I, that I outlined. And so that was the start of a product more like that we have today. Um, as far as the demonstrations, yes, they were trying to do that. Uh, sometimes they'd set up sort of tents in major cities, they being the uh, Japanese um, Central Tea Association, the representatives in the US, um, but then also, they made big pushes at the World's Fair. And so, for example, in Omaha, I think it was in 1898, and when they had the World's Fair, uh, this was all when these negative campaigns were come out, they said, we're gonna, they being these representatives at a table or the 
the, the place they had where they were giving samples of Japanese green tea. They made a push to say the Americans came by, don't have cream and don't have sugar out there and say, please try it straight. Please try and, and, and like it the way it is. And only if they asked for it, would they be allowed to have milk and sugar, which I, is something that I, I understand where they're coming from, but it was also very risky because Americans since the, you know, around 1800 had liked their green tea with a lot of milk and sugar in it. So trying to sell this, this product of which you have a lot of pride in, and understandably so, I think was a real challenge um, for the, the, the Japanese tea merchants. And, and you, you outlined in the conclusion of your talk a, a very fascinating process of how green tea then became identified as a kind of a health food later on and its high vitamin C content. Um, when they were marketing this in the late 19th and early 20th century, was it being marketed as something that was healthy or was it being marketed more as a stimulant that could you know, do the same thing for you that coffee or any of the other kind of stimulants that were widely consumed could do? You mean marketing in Japan or, or in, in the U.S.? In the U.S. Um, well, there are various times. Uh, actually, the health stuff is done really only in the 1920s. Uh, that's when that starts. The, the Japanese uh, tea merchants, they um, hired J. Walter Thompson to try and set up some national campaigns, and they try the health stuff. It doesn't really work. Um, they actually... What finds more success is the idea of tea as a relaxing beverage, which sounds <laughs> interesting to, um, to, to say that, but there's also in some of these ads to say that um, a person working in an office, um, if they would drink green tea, Japanese green tea at two or three in the afternoon, they had the energy to work out the rest of the day. That's really when those campaigns of health and, and stimulating as a stimulating beverage are really from the 1920s and 1930s. All right, uh, more questions. We're, we're having wonderful questions come in. Um, so someone asked, you mentioned that from the 1920s on, the Japanese tea merchants turned their eyes to the domestic market due to the increasing popularity of teas produced in British ruled India. Then how about in the 1930s and the 1940s, particularly during the time when US-Japan relations deteriorated during the war? Did the Japanese tea merchants ever get back to their sales after World War II? And I think that means after their sales in the US. Right, they never, um, in the occupation period, there was hope um, that they might be able to restart it. And the occupation government, uh, SCAP did give a lot of money and funds to rehabilitate the tea industry because at the end of the war, tea fields were uh, converted to produce uh, staples, food staples. Um, and there was a hope to sell to the United States, but actually what turned out to be the market after World War II was North Africa. Uh, Morocco and Algeria became the main uh, destinations for Japanese green tea, a trade that continued until the 1970s. And I should note, I didn't have time to put it in the presentation, but during the 1930s, there was a big push to sell uh, more tea to the Japanese empire, to Manchuria. Um, and this is all along the health line, um, Japanese tea merchants would go to Manchuria and try and convince the people there that they should, uh, in the winter, when they don't have many vegetables, that you could drink Japanese green tea, you'll get your vitamin C, and it'll be great for you. And it was successful to a point, um, but it, it, it didn't take the place of sales to the US. And what is the green tea market like in Japan today? Is it primarily for uh, domestic consumption or where are the large export markets? And also, I wonder if you could give us a sense of the importance of green tea exports to the United States, to the Japanese economy over this period. Was it of regional importance in a few places or was this a, an export of major significance to the national economy of Japan? In, in the 1860s, 1870s, really to around 1900, uh, tea was the second largest export from Japan. Silk was number one, overwhelmingly so, but next was tea, and after that was coal. So they were vitally important to the economy of the early Meiji period. Um, and they're important to regions like Shizuoka or other parts of Japan 
um, after the Meiji Restoration, looking to provide jobs for ex-samurai or others that have lost their positions with the Meiji reforms. And so in places like Shikoku or in central Japan, you see a real lot of, of energy and money put into developing these regional tea industries that together produce this larger export industry for Japan. Um, today, at, you know, the post-war period, most Japanese tea um, is sold domestically. There are some niche markets um, that's being sold. Some of the tea merchants that I know in Shizuoka, you know, for example, going to Europe and setting up sort of salons and, and selling types of Japanese green tea. But uh, one of the things that's also frustrating for the Japanese tea merchants today is domestically that people can buy a pretty good tea in a large plastic bottle at the supermarket for two or three dollars. And it's, it's good, right? And, and, and they, they can't diversify. It's hard to diversify, particularly as Japanese are buying, you know, in the pet bottles, these small bottles of in uh, vending machines and the like. Um, they're making money, but there's not much profit margin in those types of teas, which are very, very popular in Japan today. Uh, an, another very interesting question, and that's um, that while you've spoken about tea consumption in the U.S. West, Northeast, and West, you haven't talked much about the consumption of tea in the American South, except for the one exception of the cellar in Charleston, South Carolina. Was tea not as prevalent in the South due to the warmer weather, or mm -hmm. perhaps perceived as something looked down upon as more popular in the North? Was there less tea consumption in the South? And... If so, why do you think that might have been the case? Oh, well, thank you for the question. I, I haven't thought about that, uh, the issue of climate. Um, it, it may be a factor. I would say up until the Civil War, the green tea, same types of tea culture are pretty prominent in the North and the South. Um, that starts to change in the post-war period, um, that I think there's a little more black tea consumed in uh, the South and oolong doesn't seem to take on as it does in the north. Um, and then one thing that I finish off in the book here is also about how the icon of tea um, in the south today is sweet tea um, that emerges. Actually, I was surprised how little I was able to find on this, but really in the post-war period, um, it's black tea with a lot of sugar um, and there are particular family in regional ways, even within the South of how that's produced. Um, so great question. I'm not really sure um, what happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century in the South with tea. All right. And I, I guess I have a question uh, for you and that is, oh, uh, do you prefer Japanese green tea over other kinds of teas or, or what is your beverage of choice? Um, and then also, I, I'm kind of curious, it, it's interesting to look back at the history and see that Japanese green tea was such a dominant uh, force or such a dominant product. Do you think there's any possibility of a, of a resurgence of it that someday it could, it could take on coffee as maybe the rival stimulant of choice in the United States? Very, very speculative. Uh, <laughs> speculative. I, I, I would say no. I think it'd be hard for tea to overturn coffee. I mean, the U.S. is, I, I think the last time I looked, is probably the number two consuming state in the world um, of all the teas that are imported. And there's so much tea produced in the world today in places that weren't in the 19th century, like Vietnam, uh, as a big producer of tea. And I, I don't think it'll challenge uh, coffee. Um, I'm always intrigued by uh, how popular, though, certain types of green tea uh, that are sold, you know, in bottles that you buy in the supermarket, um, you know, with a lot of a lot of sugar added to them. So, yeah, I, I think we're probably set in that consumption pattern of mainly coffee and a little bit of tea in the United States. And what kind of tea do I like? I, I really like all kinds of tea. I love a good cup of sencha. I love bancha. A Taiwanese oolong has one of the most richest aroma um, of any tea. And I love a black tea um, with milk and sugar as well. So I, I really like different types of tea. So we can see all the different historical uh, stimulants coming, coming together in your modern, uh, your modern consumption. Right, right. <laughs>
Um, uh, we do. We have another question, and that's someone asking, "Can you show us the illustration that's behind you, or maybe oh. explain that illustration a little bit?" Sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to put this up here because this is as uh, something I bought on eBay. Uh, a lot of these things that I, I showed, and this is actually a tea chest, a uh, twenty-pound tea chest, oh, wow. and you can see inside is the tin, and on the back is the exotic uh, image of Japan. And I've seen a, a, a lot of this type of a tea chest. And so I think that these were sold as a model with already the Japanese images on them of the women in their beautiful kimono in the tea fields. If you can see here in the background, it has uh, Mount Fuji in the background. Um, and then in the middle is then one of the labels. I think it's hard to make out, but this is um, from a grocer in Peoria, Illinois, mm -hmm. that would have put his own label on top of the tea chest. And so perhaps this would have been sold to other smaller grocery stores um, in the Peoria area, or this chest might have been in the grocer uh, that a customer would go in and see this, the tea inside and say, hey, I'll take a pound of that. And the grocer would put it into the package and, and, and sell it to them. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to Sarah for asking that question. I was thinking this whole time that that was a painting behind you, <laughs> two different paintings, and did not realize that it was a, a tea chest. And so it would have been sold in bulk out of that chest and presumably put into a container that the customer would provide? Uh, no, the uh, shop, as far as I can tell, would have its own packages, usually a half pound or, or a pound. It would also have labels that were made sometimes in Japan, but um, also by uh, large American wholesalers uh -huh. um, that would have a image of some of the ones that I showed you and then the store's name on it. And okay. so we don't really have the national brands uh, dominating, at least in the tea market, until, as I said, the, the 1920s and 30s. And then uh, if, if I can ask one more question, the, the map that you showed of the United States that was shaded um, and in Japanese showing patterns of, of tea consumption. Where did you get that map and, and when was it produced? I mean, it, it looks to me like there's someone in Japan who's really compiling statistics of, of where tea is being sold in the United States. And was that being produced for research or marketing purposes or where did you come across that? Well, that was by the uh, Japan Central Tea Association. Um, and they did a lot of studies which were invaluable to me in trying to understand about the tea market because they were trying to understand themselves. And so for example, um, in the 1890s, I talked about how that uh, people in the Midwest are choosing between basket and pan fired tea. That was because a team of Japanese researchers went around to different parts of the Midwest and asked grocers and asked people, you know, what kinds of tea do they like in this area? And so this in combination with US newspapers and others was helped me trace out this story. Um, and so that map was made in the 1920s, um, but I think it does show, as I mentioned, really the pattern of consumption going back into the 1870s along that, that way. Um, so that's, that's where I found it. Well, that is, is really fascinating. And Rob, thank you for such a fascinating discussion. I think it's it's very easy to get complacent and to think of the 20th century, you know, the world we're living in as the era of globalization and as of interconnectedness. And we don't often think of Japanese tea merchants and their representatives running around the Midwest in the late 19th century, trying to do research on what kind of uh, teas American consumers would prefer so they can be more successful in the American market. Well, thank you. And if I, if I may, um, I would like to say th thank you all for coming. And if you're interested, uh, my book, um, Green with Milk and Sugar, When Japan Filled America's Teacups, is scheduled to be published by Columbia University Press um, next spring. So if you're interested, <laughs> um, I, I hope you'll look into it. Uh, we, we are very interested. And please send us uh, a URL when that comes out and we can share that along with this recording. We'll just put it in the description of the YouTube uh, video. With this, this presentation will eventually be archived on YouTube and that way anyone who finds their way to this recording can have easy access to your book and, and see where it can be published. Thank you.
Oh, and, and we have one more late coming question comes in and it says, is there any differentiation of green versus black tea as portrayed in, and I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, in the Yukio e-prints, utensils or objects that distinguish these? In the Yukio e-print? Yeah. The, um, oh, you mean going back to say the 19th century? Oh, oh you mean, uh, it, it maybe is a question about uh, between the bancha, the brown tea and green tea, is that? I, I have to admit, I don't. I do not know. I do not know what Yukio e prints refers to. Oh, these are the woodblock prints of of the nineteenth century, in particular. It grows back in the Edo period. Um, but yes, I, there wasn't really any black tea consumed in Japan um, until there were imports from India and Ceylon, um, starting in the eighteen nineties. And so, great question. I have not looked into the colors of what was in the cups um, of the Yukio e. <laughs> Um, it was see if it's whether it's green or brown, meaning is it a bancha or a uh, sencha. Um, another thing I should look at maybe before I, I, I finish off the book. All right. Well, Rob, thank you very much. And send us send us along that URL so we can share that um, with the people with uh, people who participated in the seminar. It sounds like a great book. Uh, congratulations and thank you for this really, really engaging talk. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. All right, and thank you to all of our attendees who joined us live. Uh, if you enjoyed this event, please visit us at eastasia.wisc.edu. Look at our upcoming events. Please like us on Facebook where we share um, our event schedule and also share updates from our community and share opportunities for other events like this one that might be interesting to you.